Hello and welcome to Unleashed, the show that explores how to thrive as an independent professional. Unleashed is produced by Umbrex, which connects you with the world's top independent management consultants. I'm your host, Will Bachman, and I'm so excited to have with us today uh, a guest who's been on the show a bunch of times. It was our very first guest on episode number one, uh, my good friend, the author of The Irresistible Consultant's Guide uh, to Winning Clients, David A. Fields. David, welcome to the show. Hi, Will. It is always so much fun and educational for me to be on the show with you. That's very kind of you to say. So, David, um, today I want to talk about how to run a virtual conference. And you have a, um, an event that you run called the Solo Practice Accelerator. You actually uh, talked about that uh, on the show, I think around episode 180 or so, uh, where you talked about what you do in that uh, event that two-day event, and you recently had to convert that from a physical event to an online virtual event. And I'd love to hear about your lessons learned from that and your tips for other folks that are running a virtual conference on how to make that effective. So I'd love to hear about it. All right, cool. So let's talk about that. The, so I, wanna, I want to, to frame it slightly. So first, I'm going to change it from how to run a virtual event or a virtual conference to how to run a kick-ass virtual event <laughs> because <Sounds good. laughs> uh, just because we uh, we worked really hard on it and it went extremely well. I'm not surprised. Okay, so we took a two-day in-person nine-to-five event, you know, which normally people are there, and turned it into a virtual two-day event. Even though a lot of folks said you can't do that, you can't, uh, you know, people won't stay engaged that long, and we showed that you can. You, you can run multiple day. I think four days would be really tough. I know someone who just attended one and that was really hard, but you can run a full day, a two full days, three full days and have the attendees be extremely engaged. Uh, the other thing I just want to put around it is our experience was with a fairly small group, you know, so, so call it 20 ish. And if you're going to have 200, it's going to look different than this. But if you're going to have 5, 15, 20, 30, 40, 50 even, uh, what we did, I think, again, we, we showed it can work extremely well. Great. Why don't you give and, us one, uh, and why don't you give us one minute on what the Solo Practice Accelerator is in its physical, normal form, just the agenda, so people can you know, have a little bit of context if you want. I'll include the sure. link in the show notes for when, when David goes in depth on it for that last episode. But why don't you just give us a one minute overview? Yeah. So it's really, it's a hands-on work session. It's a two-day work session on exactly what it says, accelerating your practice. And we typically have a mix uh, anywhere from people who haven't even started their practice yet that are, are solo consultants or want to be. And uh, we also, every time we have a few folks that even have boutique firms that have might, might have five or, or eight or 10 employees. And it's a mix, but in all cases, we're coming together and working through at pretty granular detail, for instance, what is your fishing line? And you get a chance to practice that in a way that you never get it, you know, in, in kind of real life. And what is your visibility building plan? And we map that out. And what's your infrastructure? What should that look like? And we map that out. And so we do all of that over the course of two days. And it's highly interactive. Normally, there's a lot of breakouts. Uh, Will, you've been in, in, you know, some of these sessions and, you know, we do a thing with the fishing line where people are facing each other and it's kind of a round robin and it's, you know, high energy and you're moving from person to person. That's the in-person experience. And while we didn't try to replicate the in-person experience, what we did do was try to say, what's the kind of amazing participative engaging experience we can create that's virtual. Okay. So what did you figure out? how did you guys do it? Well, um, there are a few things that we did, and, and there's more. We actually literally today had our session internally as a team on what do we do to make it even better next time. And there are things we can do even better next time. But we did a, a lot right. The, there are some, some sort of funny mechanics, I will say, that, that we did right and I would encourage people to do. Because we went from uh, an in-person to virtual, we were transitioning, we had to send materials to everyone which normally we, we would give in person. For instance, as you know, Will, it's critical at any one of my events to enjoy very good chocolate. So we had to send chocolate. And, you know, so as long as we're sending chocolate 
and worksheets and all of that. I also purchased for everyone and sent to them a headset. Well, the reason I did this is because audio quality is much better when you're wearing a headset. Not necessarily what you hear, but what everybody else hears when you're talking. And so I sent everybody a headset. Everybody wore the headsets uh, or they had their own. Um, and that made sure that the audio, which is really fundamental, really basic, was good and working. Um, we insisted everybody be on webcam. So there's, there's no one sort of drifting off doing other things. And at the beginning, I set the ground rules. Turn off everything else. Turn off your phones and have no other applications running. The only application running should be what we're doing right here. So we kept people's focus. So sort of almost like some basic hygiene issues on how to run a meeting become even more important when you're running a virtual session. Yeah, that, um, that point about did ask, use, yeah, that point about asking people to be present and just to get off email, shut down applications, don't multitask, really good takeaway. Right. And your broader point about setting ground rules before an event that everyone can agree to and buys into, or, or at least if you kind of top down, you set them, great tip there. I'm sorry, keep going. Yeah. Well, we, we use Zoom as a platform, which a lot of people are using. We used it because... Uh, at least as we're doing this right now. I mean, we use Zoom anyway as a company, but the it has breakout rooms. And having breakout rooms was a critical part of what we're we're trying to do is get allow consultants to talk with each other and help each other and get input from each other. And so we had to have breakout rooms. Before the meeting happened, we sent out instructions and I posted a video to familiarize people with Zoom and also with the breakout rooms because there are some quirks to it and it's easy to get lost. Um, and again, as you said, in you're saying the importance of ground rules. We made sure people knew when you're going to a breakout room is not the time to take a break, right? <laughs> now is not the time to get up and wander away, right? There's other people waiting, right? And they don't know where you've gone, right? So in normal live, you see, you know, you can call, hey, uh, I'll be right back. I got to run to the bathroom, something like that. Right. But you can't do that virtually. So we had to make clear we're going to send you to breakout rooms. When we do that, you have to go because there's someone waiting for you. Yeah. And everybody was great. Um, similarly, and I'm just going to sort of rapid fire throw things out here. OK, well, keep, just, going. Um, yeah, keep going. The so w one thing we realized is that also is, is very difficult to do actually on a on a live session. And you and I have both experienced this is bring people back from any kind of break or any kind of breakout. It's like, how do you get people to sit down? It's hurting cats, especially if you have 20, 30, 40 people or more to get them all back on time is nigh on impossible. So what we did is we built into PowerPoint, into our presentations, a timer, an on-screen timer. That, so I didn't have to leave the application. There's nothing else. And there was, if we went on a break, there was a big thing on the screen with a countdown timer until the break ends. And as soon as it ended, it went to a page. It says, time's up. We're restarting. I would go from there back into, you know, onto the, the presentation and everybody was back. Mm. It was a beautiful thing. Will <laughs> sounds <laughs> better sounds than, like... <laughs> better than in person. Yeah. It sounds like you and I both, uh, you know, had, you know, when you're bringing people back, it's like, okay, come on, we're starting now. Let's go. And it's just, it's uh, oh. that sounds like it was better than real life. It was better in real life. I mean, you know, we, so we use, um, I, I have in my, my office here, a cowbell. And we have found that's the best device in an in-person setting for getting everybody to come back together. It's this really crazy loud cowbell. The, 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 the virtual timer works so much better. I mean, it was a great timer. People knew exactly how long they had and when we were going to start. And, you know, and so that worked. So, now, I will say we, inv we invested in technology. Okay for this. Um, I set up a studio. Um, so th this was not a, a, you know, just sort of a, I'll sit in front of my webcam and we'll just give the same content. We set up a studio and the studio had multiple camera angles. Um, I had a very large monitor next to me. I mean, like a, a huge screen TV, one of the biggest ones you can get. So there was a camera angle, much like on the TV, uh, like when you watch the news and there's a presenter and he's, and he's got the board next to him and he's, he's demonstrating stuff. So there was that kind of angle where it was, you could see me. So it was a little bit more engaging. 
with me next to the monitor presenting. Then we had a close-up angle so that if I wanted to talk directly to people or people were, were asking questions, there was, there was that. Then also the, the presentation itself, when, when I was presenting content, that could go full screen or have that full screen with me picture in picture, so me in there. And we needed uh, me as a presenter, and then I had two people on my team working, and we needed at least those two people to make this thing run smoothly. One was the Zoom controller, so someone who was setting up all the breakout rooms ahead of time and moving people. And then when it came time to do the breakouts, it very smoothly transitioned people into the rooms because she had been doing that behind the scenes, and she could get everybody into the rooms. And then someone, we had a video controller and, and a, a fairly sophisticated video setup um, to be able to go from camera to camera and, you know, do all these different things and feed it all into Zoom. That's cool. So your uh, studio, is, that, is, your studio is like right at your house? Yeah. I mean, we, it's, yes, it, it, we, we converted my family room <laughs> into a studio. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I, fortunately, I, I realized this early that we were going to need to do this. Uh -huh. And I just ordered, it, it, you know, I just ordered a whole bunch of equipment and uh, got all the equipment. And, if, if, and set it up. And maybe if you're willing, on. David, maybe you could send me the your shopping list of the stuff that you bought, like any screens that go behind you, or the cameras, or anything that might be a really useful yeah. resource to include in the show yeah. notes. And at some point, we could have a technical discussion because we did learn technical things. For instance, when you're presenting next to a monitor mm -hmm. and you have a, a video camera pointed at you or a webcam. That monitor is throwing out photons, yeah. right? It's like, you know, just it, blasting them out. And uh, a webcam or a video camera is going to look at that and go, ooh, look at that. All those yummy photons coming from that monitor. I'm going to focus on that. And anything else around it is going to be dark, including the presenter. Yeah. And even if you dim that way down, you'll have that problem. So we figured out some tricks around that. Um, another thing we realized beforehand was that typically – in a live setting with you of breakout rooms, you'll send people to their breakout rooms, but if there's instructions or things they need to refer to, they can pop their head back into the main room and look at the screen, right? You kind of leave that stuff up there for them to look at. Mm. And, and, and they come in, they look and they say, oh, these were the instructions. Well, how are you gonna do that in Zoom? Because in Zoom breakout rooms are really new instances of meetings. There, you can't go back to the main room easily or pop back and forth. So what we actually did is we bought, uh, you know, again, a, lots of technology investment. We bought a whole um, sort of slew of tablet computers, just little tablets. And they were also participants in the meeting. And the person who was running the, the Zoom portion of it had literally a shelf with a whole display of tablets. It's quite funny. And, and we had them as participants in the meeting pre-assigned to one to each breakout room. And then when the people go to the breakout rooms, she would then uh, hit each one to join and then share the instructions. So you had a participant in each breakout room just sharing the instructions, having it on screen if you wanted it. Yeah. If um, anyone from Zoom is listening, that sounds like a feature that they might want to add so people don't need to buy Oh, we have a whole list. <laughs> 20, we have a whole list of features. <laughs> we, we've, we're sending them a note saying, look, here's all the extra things we need to actually be able to do this better. Yeah. Um, but, you know, that was a hack. And, and it was a hack that, that was really effective. So a lot, David, of your sessions um, re involves – there also be usually some period where people, okay, you know, will sit kind of by themselves, and you'll give them an assignment to yes. what are your, you know, headlines that you're going to have on your content, or what content could you write, or what thought leadership channel do you want to use, or what's your fishing line, and then share yep. those with others. How did you practically get that part done in the virtual session? Did you have people? Did you have a break? Did you have sort of a timeout where? People were not in any breakout session, but just working on that yes. on their own and then come. How did that work? Yep. So again, so what we had is an on-screen timer and I would say, you know, let's work on this, work on your, again, whatever it is, work on this plan for 15 minutes, your, your fishing line or work out the problem in 15 minutes. And the zoom controller on my end would mute everybody. We had an on-screen timer that actually showed them the 15 minutes counting down. And, uh, you know, and we got to see it, it in, 
a much more human interaction in some ways than we normally would. Because if you happen to, to glance at the whole gallery, uh, which I would do probably more than others, you'd see someone's cat walking across a laptop. That happened quite a bit. You know, someone, you know, uh, sort of uh, bobbing the baby up and down on their, their knee. You know, these kinds of things, <laughs> which you don't normally get to see. Uh, and then they would come back. We did that, and there was one exercise towards the beginning um, where we had everybody raise their hand. In part, we had people practice some of these skills at the very beginning, the very first exercises, to ha- get them used to how Zoom worked. And we had people raise their hands, um, and then when they were done with the exercise, they would lower their hand. And that way, um, I could see sort of who was ready. So we did, we did that. We didn't use that as much. And, um, I think it worked better just to have a clock. Um, and when also you, what was helpful for, sorry, go on, Will. And when you had people do exercises, were they just kind of writing it by hand themselves? Yeah. Or was there no collaborative thing where you could like see everybody else's response or see everybody else we, on a Google doc or something like that? Yeah. So we thought about that. We considered that and opted not to do it. And it's, there, and there's a piece still we need to work out. We, we really actually we played a lot with that, with, with some whiteboards, um, with Google Docs. And we decided not to do that because we, we actually wanted one application open on the participant's computer. Mm-hmm. And that was Zoom. What they could do was use chat inside Zoom. And uh, Zoom also has a whiteboard, but at the moment, at least, it's not particularly good. Uh, sorry for if you're, if you're listening and you're from Zoom. The um, so we found that people, especially like in a fishing line, they just talked to each other and wrote things down, which was kind of like it was in real life, Um, you know, or not in real life, but in person, you know, physical space. And that worked fine. And I think not having an extra application open, I still feel like that's the right decision. The more complexity you add, that's yet another application that has to be monitored, supported by your technical crew. you know, deal with anything, and it becomes a distraction. When you and we 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 felt it was very important to eliminate distractions. Yeah, and the video person that you had working, were they yeah. in your living room there, or were they working remotely and just selecting yeah. between different videos? Well, in this case, I'm fortunate because you know I was, I, I could enlist my wife. Uh, okay. And say, you're the video person. <laughs> oh, okay. There we go. <laughs> uh, otherwise, it would have been challenging. It, it is actually important to have the video person in the same room. And one of the things we, we had to have some signaling back and forth. For instance, if I, you know, it's for me to say, you know, go to camera two, right. kind of thing. Um, and so, and we did a lot of rehearsing and practicing with the team because the zoom controller was actually, she had been stuck in Montana. Mm. Um, she couldn't get home because all the flights kept getting canceled. That part was fine, but having someone in the room was particularly useful. We had yet another computer and monitor set up um, where I can show you all the monitors we had set up. It, it's, it's somewhat crazy. Um, with a keypad um, sort of remote to it that the, the controller in the room could use to signal me that there was a question or to speed up or to slow down or um, that I had run over, that it was break time. Mm-hmm. And so I had another signal coming on to me um, as a speaker or as a presenter to let me know, um, especially questions, which was important to signal me that there were questions. So again, we found with 20 people in a room, if someone could just say, hey, David, and it was fine. They would just unmute themselves or use space to push and say, hey, David, I've got a quick question. Mm-hmm. And that worked just like um, in person. It, it worked extremely well. Yeah, there's a place. Of, there's probably a point where that breaks down a little bit, and that you need to have people use the chat. Uh, where you know, if you get to fifty or sixty, then it it can become maybe unwieldy. But you know, right. up to a certain point, people well, can. Rather than the chat, actually, I, I highly recommend using the. Um, hand, uh, hand raising. This okay. is one of the things we actually discussed this morning as a team. The chat is actually much harder to track mm. and you have to almost have a separate person managing the chat. Cause also the chat, if you have a, if we would have four or five people putting something into the chat, then you have to have the ability to scroll. Right. And, and right. And that, that's quite difficult to manage. 
On the other hand, if four or five people have questions at once or have something to say, which they do, even in our group, right? I mean, it gets it gets quite lively. Um, if people raise their hands, then you just see all the hands up and they can say, hey, Will, you, you had something you wanted to add. Um, you know, Nicole, you had something you had, wanted to add. And that so I recommend that that hand signal feature more than chat. And by raising your hand, you're not talking about physically raising your hand, but the Zoom feature where you click to raise your hand. The Zoom feature. Okay. Though as people raise their hand, when so we would have we had perhaps I, I suppose 25 people in the gallery kind of thing, and at that level, and I was facing a 40 inch monitor. Okay. Okay. So I could see everybody, um, and it's not perfect because if you're looking at the monitor, then you're not looking at the camera. And it's important to look at the camera so that you're, you're actually creating some eye contact, some virtual eye contact with your participants. Um, but I could see people raise their hands. And more importantly, the, the person in the control room working the controls, in this case, my wife, she was able to see people raising their hands, physically raising their hands, as opposed to using the, the Zoom hand raising. And what kind of camera did you um, use? Do you recall? Or if you don't, we can put it in the show notes. But, uh... We, uh, it, nothing super crazy, a Panasonic video cam, something, but um, not a cheap, that DP, was part like $25, you know, webcam. Used oh, to... no, no, no. It was, it, it was a few hundred dollars, I think. Um, each, so we had a couple of them. Um, the video controller is, is about a grand. Wow. Um, um yeah, I mean, it, it's an investment to, but on the other hand, you know, and again, we, I kind of thought about this for us, we try to put on a high end event and to be able to have the different camera views keeps it more interesting and lively mm -hmm. and allow also gives me the ability, for instance, so you can see me presenting next to the screen, which just feels more engaging. We tested this with some people before we went into it. Um, so each of the views was actually fairly important in one way or another. And the only way to get all of that was with a, you know, I may have gone overboard on the controller, um, but you know, it's, 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 it's a one-time investment. And Just like you've invested on, in high quality r recording equipment for these podcasts. Right. And the video controller, what I'm not, what is that exactly? That's something where you can switch between different video <laughs> shots. Yeah. So, you can, yes, there's very cheap versions where you can have four HDMI or 12 HDMI inputs and then switch one to another. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that you can do actually quite, quite cheaply. But to be able to mix the sound differently if you want to do that or to do picture in picture or to, to um, do lots of stuff which we, we didn't need to do, that takes a little bit more sophisticated piece of equipment. So we had video in from two separate cameras and we, we really didn't need a third. Um, just managing the two is enough. And from my computer that I was presenting from, mm -hmm. because I do have content to share. So we had a, the, from my computer, it went both to the monitor next to me and then also into the video mixer. So there were three sources all streaming into the video mixer and um, then one output, which then went into the computer, which then was hooked into Zoom. Uh, and we also, uh, I must say, we purchased sort of stupidly high um, bandwidth to make sure that we never had any problem on our end mm. with bandwidth. Mm. Yeah, that's critical. Um, yeah, so sort of like giga gigabit um, bandwidth. It up upload is more important than download. Mm -hmm. the, the, all the, the companies all promote their download speeds. But if you're running a Zoom conference, you need upload speed. Right. You need to be able to push out your video without any glitches. And and um, and you were able to purchase that upload speed from your local provider. Yes, that's interesting. Yeah, well, again, you know, it's a it was a it's a cost, it's an expense, but we're putting on a a, a high end conference here, so you know, big deal. The it was an expense because I don't need to spend three hundred dollars a month for personally for my business. I don't need that level month in month out. <laughs> um, but, you know, to, to bring it on for a month and have them install it, it's a one-time expense. Mm -hmm. And again, kind of like, you know, it's all, it, it, normally, uh, you know, it, it kind of balanced out. 
because I had much higher technology expenses doing this. And I think it is worth investing in it, not being cheap. If someone had said, David, I don't have a webcam, I would have sent them a webcam on me. Right. Um, But at this point, everybody has a webcam, so I didn't need to do that. You know, otherwise, I'm I'm catering to them and giving them all the food and, and all of that, which is also very, very expensive. So I did. I just didn't worry about that. Yeah. You say, instead, you say, I worried about how do we make it a high end experience. Excellent. So, David, this has been full of really helpful practical tips. Um, so, in terms of the technology setup, in terms of you know the kind of staff that you need behind the scenes to run one of these. Um, thanks so much for joining and sharing some tips on on your virtual event. Oh, I'm I'm happy to. There's a lot of this going around. Anyone listening, if you have questions about how to run the event or if I didn't cover something you think would be helpful, just reach out. I'm I'm happy to share. And I should also mention before we close, if you want to follow David, I love David's blog. I read it every week. It's the first thing I read on Wednesday morning. Uh, sign up for his blog. You can find out also about upcoming practice accelerators. Visit davidafields.com. And there is a lot of goodness there. David, thanks for joining. Thank you, Will.